Welcome to church again today. It's Father's Day weekend, uh, an exciting time, except for the fact that we can't really do much at all. So for those of you who are living in a house with your dad, enjoy the day. For those of you who are dads who have children living in your house, may you enjoy the day. For people like myself, uh, my parents live about 2,000 k's north of here. So the best I'll have is maybe a FaceTime call. Emma's parents, obviously, they live uh, about a half an hour away. So again, another FaceTime call is probably all we'll be able to manage this year. That being said, that doesn't mean that the relationship that we have with our dads is diminished because of distance. And hopefully today, as we go through this sermon, you will begin to understand that it's not so much about proximity as it is about the relationship and what that relationship means. So with that being said, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to worship you. And as much as we recognize the challenging times in which we live where we can't meet together physically for church and worship, we can't meet together physically with family for celebration and reconnection, we're grateful that we have you as the the father we can look up to and the one that is always with us. And I just pray that as we spend time together today, that you will send your Holy Spirit to give us an outpouring of your spirit, your blessing, as we worship. We pray this in your name. Amen. There's a story found in the book of Luke, of which you're most likely familiar with. Now, whether you've been to church for your whole life, whether you've never really attended a church worship service, perhaps today, is your first time. You may have heard of this story, you may have heard of a term that comes from this story, and that story is in the book of Luke chapter 15, and it's the story of the prodigal son. And so I would ask wherever you are, if you have the ability to grab a Bible, um, be it on the internet, if you've just got Google open, or on your phone, let's open up to the book of Luke chapter 15, and we'll read from verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had had, and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders, yet you gave me not even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends, but this son of yours who has squandered your property... With prostitutes, he comes home. You kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, 
and everything I have is yours. But he had to se- but we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. There's many things that we can take away from this parable, from this story, and oftentimes we call this the parable of the prodigal son. And when I was growing up, we would focus on the son that left as the prodigal son. But of course, as I've grown up, and perhaps you yourself have come to understand that there's actually a lot that we can learn from the son that remained a prodigal son. So perhaps not the prodigal son, but the prodigal sons. But more importantly, I find that this story, this narrative, this parable, teaches us, teaches us a lot, not just about the attitude of the sons, but the attitude of the father. And so today I want us to share in some time together as we explore the, the attitude of this father in this parable. And I would ask you to perhaps consider how this might relate to you, the relationship that you have with your father, perhaps the relationship that you have with your heavenly father. So let's have a look together at this parable. The first thing that I want to raise is that in this whole narrative, the father, even though he knows what is best for his son, allows his son to make a decision that he doesn't support. Not only doesn't he support the decision, he allows it to be made and makes provision for the decision to be followed through with. Now, that's a difficult position for fathers to be in. I know when I was growing up, my father would often disallow things to happen, would intervene when silly decisions would be made on my part or the part of my brothers, because he not only knew what was best for us, he knew what was safest for us, he knew the best way to go about it. But in this narrative, we have this, as I'm understanding, an adult son making a very poor decision that the father disagrees with, but still, because of the relationship and love that he has for his son, he allows the decision to go through. Now, the parable doesn't explain why the prodigal son wants to leave home. We could surmise that it could be the rules. We could surmise that it could be that he's the second born son, not the oldest. So the birthright doesn't quite match. We could surmise that he just wants to experience the world and travel around. We don't know the reason, but we do know this. He no longer wants to live with his father. The son seemed sick and tired of living according to his father's rules. Instead, the son wanted to live under his own set of rules, which is to say, no rules at all. Perhaps that's where you find yourself today. Perhaps that's a challenge or a relationship dynamic that you've had with your father. Have you wanted to live under your own rules? Have we as Christians wanted to live under rules that are not godly rules? Have we turned our way, have we turned ourselves away from God? The, the other thing that we don't really know in this story is how long, how much time passes between the leaving of the sun and the returning of the sun. It could be a matter of weeks, it could be a matter of months, I'm going to suggest that it's a matter of years. This is a full inheritance that the son has received and he's squandered it to the point that he's now eating with pigs and he's got to the point where he says, you know what, even my father's servants are treated better than I'm currently treated. I'm going to go back. And so I'm suggesting that it's probably some years after the event. And as we read through the narrative, we find not only has this father never given up hope on his son returning, but by a the narrative, it seems that the father is sitting at the city gates, keeping watch, looking out, waiting for his son to return. And though his son left home, perhaps some years ago, the father never stopped loving him. And the son's request for his inheritance implied that he never wanted to return home. Yet this father yearned for that relationship so much, and yearned for that return of his son, that he waited day after day after day until the day his son finally returned home. Again, perhaps that's the relationship dynamic you have with your father, the relationship dynamic I have with mine, where my dad says something when I'm a bit younger, I think, what would you know? But then as I grow up and I begin to understand what adulting might actually be about, I realise there may have been some wisdom in the things that he had to share with me. 
And when we focus on this story of the prodigal son returning to the father, it's easy to focus on what the prodigal father, uh, sorry, what the prodigal son's father does. That is, he runs to him, he embraces him, but less obvious is what he doesn't do. Have you ever thought about that in your relationships with people? That oftentimes the most meaningful things on reflection can be the things that we don't say, the things that we don't do. You see, the prodigal son's father does not say, you know, I understand why you left. After all, my set of rules are really quite strict and hard to follow. So the fact that you've come back, I'm really grateful for that. So I'm going to relax the rules for you a little bit. So welcome home. Now, I don't want to say that our relationship with God and our relationship with church is all about the rules, but I am going to suggest that there are some expected things of people who follow Jesus. There are some things that we do that we need not compromise on. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon titled Celebrating Destruction, and if you haven't heard that, I'd encourage you to go back and have a look at the sermon on Celebrating Destruction destruction. And one of the things that I want to draw from that sermon into today is perhaps some of the rules that we need not uh, bend or break or forget about is the requirement that God has for us to go and minister to those who often are f- who often are forgotten by the religious people. Now this is a hard pill to swallow because the religious people, that often is us. So the challenge is, Let's go and minister to the downcast, the downtrodden, the outcast, those forgotten people, the homeless, those in a lower socioeconomic situation, the LGBT community. Uh, As we look around the world, we can look at the racism that is prevalent uh, in various places. So let's stand up for and minister to those who are experiencing racism. These are the things we need not compromise on. In fact, perhaps these are things that we need to restore in our relationship with each other and with the Father. So when we think about the non-bending of rules, why didn't the Father say these words to his son? For that matter, why hadn't the Father already searched for his son to tell him that? There's no evidence in this narrative that the Father has gone running and searching the countryside and the countries for his son. And the reality is, The reason that probably didn't occur is because he didn't know where his son had gone. You see, it was never the father's rules that were the problem because his rules are rooted, and we talk about God the Father, his rules are rooted in truth. The problem is, it was the son's, it's our refusal to follow those rules that results in misery. What I wonder In our experience in church today, are we feeling unfulfilled? Do we go and experience worship and go, oh, that didn't really meet my needs? Perhaps it doesn't meet our needs because we're not meeting the needs of those God has called us to meet the needs of. You see, the only problem here is that we as sons, we as daughters, want the rules to suit us rather than to suit the God that we serve. Only was it in being weighed down in sin did this prodigal son finally discover that his father's yoke was easy and his burden was light. We have this narrative in the book of Matthew where the Pharisees are rebuked by Jesus saying that people are going to be made twice the sons of hell as the Pharisees are. And I wonder at times, do we try and make people twice the sons of hell in bringing them into our midst than what we are? Kenneth Bailey, who's an author of a book called The Cross and the Prodigal, drawing a comparison between the prodigal son and the cross of Jesus, explains that if the Jewish son lost his inheritance amongst the Gentiles and then returned home, the community had to perform a ritual, a ceremony, and I'm going to butcher this word, called the Kizaza. What they would do is they would find a large pot, they would break the pot in front of him and yell, you are now cut off from your people. And the community would then totally reject him. And this would happen when the son tries to return home. And so why did the father run to his son? Because his father knew of 
the Jewish custom. He knew of the ceremony. He knew that if the Jewish leaders, the community leaders, got to his son first and performed this ceremony, then there would be no turning back. So he ran in order to get to his son before he entered the village. The father runs, to sh and, and in running, he shames himself because Jewish men used to wear these tunics, almost like dresses, you see. Um, and in order to run, he would need to grab the, the kind of the lower part of his tunic and hitch it up so that as he ran, he wouldn't risk falling over the, the, um, the hem of the, the tunic. And so in doing so, he would expose his legs, which was a shameful act. Running for a man was a shameful act. And so in this narrative, we have the father willing to shame himself for the sake of relationship restoration with his son in an effort to get to his son before the community gets to him so that his son does not experience shame and humiliation, taunting and, reje and rejection. The father instead says, I'm going to take that on myself and experience that shame, experience that humiliation, experiencing that taunting and rejection and protect my son from that. What a beautiful picture that is of what God did through the death of Jesus on the cross, sending Jesus down to be the sacrifice on the cross, to bear your sins and my sins, to bear your shame and my shame for the sake of our restored relationship with him. You see, the amazing application in our own lives is crystal clear. That heavenly father, that God has taken our shame, put it on Jesus, who's endured that on the cross, not just because he was forced to, because that didn't happen, but because the relationship that he wants with us as his sons and daughters is so strong, as Father, he will do anything to bring us back into his home. You see, we don't have to fear going home to our Father and confessing our sins, because no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've done that wrong thing, Jesus has already borne that shame. And God has already said, your relationship to me, I've already had the price paid in your relationship it's already restored if only you're willing to come home. In this parable, only the father can restore the son to full sonship in the family. And in our case, as sinners, there's nothing that we can do to restore ourselves in our lost relationship with God. He calls us and he waits for us. It's up to us to take that first step. And when we do, and we turn around, to kind of see where God is, we realize that he's not off in the, in the distance, but he's already running to meet us. He's already running. He's already run to meet us. He's right there, if only we're willing to accept him. And so here we have this father who runs to meet his son to protect him. He embraces his son and leads him back to safety. You can imagine him just grabbing his jacket if he had one, and putting it over his son and putting his son under his arm and walking back through the gates of the village to bring him back into restored relationship. And when they get home, they celebrate the return of this lost child. This lost child who's a child, not a servant. And I wonder whether you paid attention to the text that we've read in Luke chapter 15, that this son had made up in his mind a decision to, to say three things to his father. And so the three things that he was going to say from verse 19, sorry, from verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, point one, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Point two, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And point three, make me like one of your servants. And when he gets to his father, he starts, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Point one, I am no longer worthy to be to be called your son, point two. And before he even gets to point three, his father knows where he's leading, as God knows where we're leading. When we try and make up excuses and try and restore relationships in our own capacity, of which the son has and the daughter has no right to restore the relationship, it's only up to the father. The father interjects and says, quick, bring the robe and put it on him. Bring the ring, put the ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found in its cause of reason to celebrate. You see, God knows that we will try to restore the relationship we have with him, and he 
puts a stop to it straight away. But the other learning we can get from this, not only is God celebrating our return, but he actually asks his whole household to celebrate that return, the servants and even his other son. Do we celebrate the returned people into the kingdom of God like the the prodigal son's return was celebrated by the father here? As other sons and daughters, as servants in the house of God, do we celebrate when people come home? There's a great learning that I have from this parable that I, I think is is tough for me at times to swallow and perhaps the same for you. And that is in relation to the grace that the father shows here. The grace that is bestowed upon this son for the rest of his life, he's going to be considered a son. He's already got his inheritance. That inheritance is already ours. Eternal life is already ours. Are we willing to live in the house of the father and accept the grace that he's given more than that? Are we willing to pass that grace on to other people and to celebrate the, the returned other sons and daughters when they make the choice to return? Are we willing to pass that grace on to other people as Jesus passed it on to us with his death on the cross? Are we willing to do these things? You know, though the father loved both of his children deeply, neither of them embraced that love. And Jesus' point is clear. There are two ways to run from him. There are two ways to run from the Father. There are two ways to run from God. We see that the younger son more easily ran from God through running away, taking inheritance, rebelling, wasting his his life on, on all sorts of different things that ended up with him living in a pig pen, eating from the, the same food that the pigs were eating satisfying his own selfish desires. It's an easy comparison of turning and running away from God. Yet it's harder for us to see that turning away and that not embracing Jesus' love from those who run headlong into religious activity, to serving the church, thinking that we can impress God by our commitment to being a deacon, to taking up the offering, to leading out as an elder in communion, to running teen ministry, to running children's ministry. We think that those people are so holy because they're involved in ministry. They're involved in church activity. But what we realize that oftentimes, again, not speaking of anyone but myself, oftentimes that busyness is almost a way to to work my way back into relationship and restored relationship with God. Oftentimes I can slave away for God because I fear the consequences of not slaving away for God. And like the Pharisees that Jesus told this story to, oftentimes I can feel justified by the anger that I can have of the more obvious sin of others. You know, there's no real hierarchy of sin. Sin is sin. And all of us have fallen short. And all of us have sinned and need Jesus' blood to cover us, to wash us white as snow. We all, whether we've remained in church our whole life, whether we've remained connected to Jesus through that church connection our whole life, we all need to have a repaired and restored relationship with him. I wonder today, as we reflect on the Father as we reflect on the parable of the prodigal son, whether you're willing to accept, whether you're willing to challenge yourself to turn back and go home and come under the restored, grace-filled relationship that God has waiting for you. It's not something that we do just once in our lives. Perhaps it's something we need to do each and every day, many moments throughout the day so that we recognize that the only way in which our relationship with God is assured is through the willingness that God has already shown us in shaming himself through the death of Jesus on the cross. That's the kind of love the Father has for us. 
That's the kind of love that our Heavenly Father has planned for us so that we can have that not just in this lifetime, but in the eternal lifetime that is to come. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this story, which may often be seen just as a story or a children's narrative, has so much depth of meaning. And today we've not even had an opportunity to, to go into to much of that depth. But Lord God, I pray that as we reflect on this weekend of Father's Day, that we reflect on this story, we recognize that the same father in this story who shamed himself to save his son reflects the same father in you, God, who shamed himself to save us, your sons and daughters. And Lord, I pray as we go throughout each and every day, we are reminded that it's about the restored relationship that you're offering us and that through that restored relationship and grace that you've given us, we have a responsibility to celebrate the return of other people who recognize their need to be restored to you as well. We have the opportunity to share that grace with people who we often forget about. And I pray that from this moment forward, we recognize that as children of the living God, we will be willing to make a difference. We will be willing to take action and that we will be willing to share this grace with all that we come into contact with as you have shared it with us. I pray in your name. Amen.